everyone to this special episode on on the God Forum. Today we will discuss about uh, Ashenda. Um, Ashenda is one of the biggest carnivals in in Tigray. Uh, originally, it was um, supposed to commemorate the ascension of the the putative Saint Mary um, following her domination, and it has slowly morphed into a cultural event where women celebrate different aspects of life, uh, starting from beauty to uh, sisterhood to womanhood to um, liberty, freedom, and other aspects, femininity even, and different other aspects that we will um, discuss today. We have uh, gathered um, a wonderful array of panelists today. I will introduce the panelists and I will ask them to introduce themselves and then we will go into the uh, details of today's uh, discussion. So for panelists, we have Dr. Hagos Abraha, who is who has a PhD in philology and he will give us some scholarly um, look into uh, Ashenda. We also have um, Chelsea Baldwin, who is a historian and on Tigrayan women especially. So it would be interesting to get her uh, insights as well as to what it means uh, with regard to um, women in Tigray and the struggle and Ashenda and other aspects. We also have Elizabeth um, uh, She is from uh, Merava Estate. And she speaks on different aspects about Tigray. And we're really grateful that she joined us today. She will talk about her experience in Ashanda and, and other aspects as well. We also have Rowena Kasai from Tigrayan Youth uh, Network based in, in London. She would also give us different insights from the point of view of a diaspora celebrating Ashanda. We also have Kasanet Haile Molla, who will also have, give us a different perspective of, of Ashanda so welcome everybody. Please uh, say a few words about yourselves. I will start with, with Hagos. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I am Hagos uh, Abraha. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I have been studying uh, philology. Uh, this time I'm, I'm working my postdoctoral research in Hamburg University in manuscript studies, specifically in uh, manuscript studies of uh, Tigray. So I think that's enough. Thank you, um, Hagos. And Chessie? Um, hello, everyone. I'm really excited to be here today. Um, I'm mostly an observer in this one because I'm obviously not to Brian and I don't participate in a gender, but I'm a historian of gender and womanhood and uh, expressions of femininity. Um, so the meanings of the agenda celebration are really relevant in my work, um, specifically how women can use joy as a form of resistance. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what our other panelists have got to say today as well. And Elizabeth. Thank you, Tahlai. Um, I am Elizabeth Yehdabu Gavrasilase, and I, like you said, I'm from Maravaset. Uh, I just want to thank you, uh, you, Tahlai, for inviting me and Tilhat for um, also for uh, creating this opportunity uh for for us to reflect on our experiences uh, about agenda and in general uh, talk about uh, what's happening in light of the agenda celebrations so thank you for inviting me to this wonderful gathering our pleasure rowena um hi my name is rowena kasai and i'm um part of Tigray youth network which is a Diaspora Initiative based in the UK and I'm based in London. And um, I'm very excited to um, see what we unfold in this discussion. And I'm, um, yeah, really looking forward to it. And finally, Kasane. Hi, everyone. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Thank you for uh, inviting me here. Um, well, I'm Kasane. I am Gual Ashenda. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you all of you for, for joining. I'm really looking forward to this discussion and I'm really happy that you have joined for this uh, panel discussion. I know that it was on short notice, but um, hopefully we will uh, we'll have an interesting discussion. So I will I will start with uh, with Hagos and I was wondering if you could uh, give us a little bit of an insight into the originations of, of Ashenda from its religious uh, roots and how it historically morphed into into a big cultural event that has transcended its, its religious significance and it has become a rather all-inclusive religion agnostic um, event. So if you could reflect on, on those aspects, uh, Hagos. 
Okay. Uh, thank you, Tahlai. Uh, Ashenda is uh, one of the, the most remarkable uh, ceremonies or festivals in Tigray, but it's not well studied uh, scientifically. Um, and there are some scholars say, or some scholars try to connect it with some of uh, uh, ancient religious uh, things like with Israel, for example, with the history of uh, Joftah, as it's written in the, in the book of uh, Kings, sometimes some people try to connect it with uh, uh, the history of uh, Noah, as it's in the Bible, and sometimes the history of or the story of Eve and Adam that Eve had to cover her her neck body with uh, with the leaf and um, connecting it or interconnecting it with the, the Ashenda leaf. So there are lots of uh, hypothetical uh, explanations about Ashenda in connection to Judaism and Christianity and some of the cultures. But I personally would say Ashenda is uh, homegrown and an indigenous uh, culture of Tigrayans. And it's uh, fully a kind of folklore or it can be anthropologically explained that uh, all the ingredients all the values, the social values that we have in Ashenda are uh, from, from homegrown materials. Like it has an oral tradition, it has the social uh, performing folk arts, um, it has this material culture. I mean, all the four uh, kinds of uh, folklore that we have in Ashenda are indigenous. For example, like if we compare with Mescal, with Epiphany, um, Easter uh, or like uh, Eid al-Adha, these religious and cultural festivals, we have still some international or a kind of common ingredients or uh, values there. Like when we think of Mescal festival, the idea of cross, for example, is a global symbol. Uh, but anything that we have in Ashenda is uh, exclusively from, from Tigray. Uh, so I would personally say, <clears throat> Uh, Cynthia Reda Waksum uh, has formulated these four cyclic seasons, the summer, the spring, the winter, and autumn. Uh, that's Cynthia Red who has formulated for the first time. Uh, so during the summer season, uh, we can observe some kind of, of course, as elsewhere in the world, uh, a kind of environmental and ecological springing or flourishing, popping up, and uh, a kind of like it's not only ladies, but also um, all people, animals, flowers, plants flourish, jump, um, spring. Uh, so, this is a kind of environmental, ecological, plus cultural influence that has substantiated to. To, to bring the elements, the social ingredients of Ashenda that we have today. Uh, but, and then later it could have had, uh, or it brought based on the Christian exegesis or hermeneutics, and then it has been Christianized, and then metaphorically connected with the ascension of St. Mary and the, the relation between St. Mary and the Matthew, I mean, Thomas the apostle, while she was ascending to the heaven. Uh, and then the garment that the idea of the garment, the symbol of the garment there is sometimes a met metaphorical uh, symbol or an allegory for, for Ashenda leaf. Uh, so there is always a question, is Ashenda religious or cultural kind of question, um, which always can trigger what is the demarcation between culture and religion, of course? Uh, yeah, religion is more institutionalized, but still it's an institutionalized form of belief. And then we can think of social reconstruction and so on. And then we have also had in Tigray uh, the idea of cosmotics and then, uh, and, and then kind of social congregation of gender specific things. It's not only Ashenda, by the way, that we have in Tigray. We have different cultures, like there was Aigo, there was a female social institution like Devarta, 
um, so many many things. The only thing that we are that the only thing where we are concerned more about agenda is because it has been it's one of the climax uh, example of uh, ladies institution institutional or a kind of carnival uh, practice in Tigray. So I I personally would say at the beginning it is from culture from um, from folklore of Tigrayans because everything is indigenous. And then everything was from cultural perspective, ecological and environmental uh, influences is el elsewhere there. And then later, which is the church and the state in general in Tigray or in Ethiopia has been traveling together you know, throughout the history after the introduction of Christianity. And then the church has been assimilating uh, or a kind of, um, th there was, there was uh, this, dialect continuum of culture and religion under the same node and, and, and supporting it with exegesis or this, what we call it, hermeneutics. And then that's why we have this andemta uddase mariam and connecting it with uh, the with, uh, uh, ashenda. Uh, so uh, generally ashenda is uh, one of the most a wonderful, intangible uh, Tigrayan heritage. It's the day of freedom of ladies. Uh, I think others will explain it more. And um, I, I always wonder why UNESCO has registered the uh, Mescal Festival uh, before, uh, before uh, Ashenda, because Ashenda is peculiar, what matters as a global heritage registration like in UNESCO is the peculiarity and all the ingredients that the, the, the heritage has. So from all perspective, Ashenda is, uh, I don't think there will be such kind of festival, such kind of ceremony or carnival, gender specific, very indigenous, huge in number, millions of Tigran ladies celebrate it everywhere in Tigray, which sometimes has been extended to some other neighbor, neighboring regions. So uh, Ashenda is not well promoted around uh, the world and, and, and it's not uh, recognized by UNESCO. Of course, there was a kind of attempt to studying for registration in the last two, three uh, years. But um, yeah, yeah, it has to be given an emphasis for to be one of the most wonderful, intangible world heritage. Uh, it's cultural, religious. Uh, I mean, in Ashenda, you can learn. It's like also an open air school in, in many things when it comes to uh, to grand culture. Uh, that's all what I can say. Yeah, well, well, thank you, Hagos. I think that was an excellent exposition into the different parts of uh, and aspects of Ashenda, but I think for me, the most important um, thing you mentioned was the distinction between religion and, and culture. I think when people debate about whether Ashenda should be um, categorized as a religious event or as a cultural event, they presume that there is a clear distinction between culture and religion, yeah. when in fact there is a strong crossover between the, the two. And it could it could be that it's both religious and, and, and cultural. And to me, it's, it's, it's something that that has started as a religious um, um, uh, festival or celebration and due to different events, it, it morphed into something that is all inclusive and that is um, religion agnostic. I think now in Tigray, people from different religions don't have problem um, reveling in and celebrating Ashenda and it has, it has grown to the point of completely transcending its, its religious um, roots. And I think that's an interesting uh, conversation that people could have. But um, I will go to to uh, to Osanet and um, ask her um, about her um, uh, memories and experience celebrating Ashenda. I would presume that you um, you had started celebrating Ashenda uh, from your young age, and you'll have fond memories of that up until now. Although this year you wouldn't have celebrated it in the most um, warm. Uh, manner as you'd have expected, given that it it it, it fell on the aftermath of the report uh, from Amnesty, and it was uh, it was the worst time to to celebrate Ashenda. But could you could you reflect uh, 
what Ashanda meant to you back then and now? Yeah. Uh... Well, it's a bit hard to actually talk of uh, after someone who knows a lot about the history and how it came uh, and all, but uh, I will just share my experience, which is um, what I remember about Ashanda is not only just the event, but the whole preparation like uh, a month ago, like the before the actual event, what we do, the, the planning and all. Uh, like for example, the kind of clothes we want to wear uh, or the kind of group we want to create because mostly if you see uh, girl Ashanda girls playing it's like they are in groups mostly those groups are neighborhood or either they are neighborhood or friends uh, well for me it was uh, my neighborhood because I was born and raised in in one uh, place <laughs> and um, so we used to plan uh, all these things and also it, to the extent that who is going to to collect the money, who's going to be leading us, who is going to, uh, where we're going to get the drums because we have drums, uh, traditional clothes and all right for the celebration. So we do this planning like uh, a month before. Um, and also we, we plan on where to meet and when to meet, like even that day, like what time and where we're going to meet. Uh, I also have my older sister. She's also uh, celebrating Ashanda with me always. And we have neighbors who are also our friends. And then we discuss with them like the kind of clothes we need to wear because we do this ahead because we also have to convince our families uh, to buy us all these uh, dresses and jewelers for the event. Uh, yeah, so since um, the holiday also, as it was a bit discussed before, uh, it commemorates the heavenly assertion of Vir Virgin Mary. Uh, we try to do the uh, fasting as well, but this is this can be a bit subjective because I'm Orthodox, so we do that um, in my family. Uh, and on the day of the event, uh, as we all know, all Tigran girls and women wear these beautiful traditional dresses, elfi. Uh, and when we go out to celebrate, our families would and all the households would go out and see us. And all the girls and women look so mesmerizing with all these colorful dresses and costumes. And also our hairs are braided, which is not mine at the moment. <laughs> and um, by the way, speaking of braiding, uh, there is this long queue when we do this braiding. Uh, I'm remembering all these details <laughs> because we always go through it every year. Uh, so we had to do it like, like we have to schedule ahead or our our sisters or moms would do it for us. If we need to go to the hairdresser, we have to schedule ahead because there's a long queue. Um, and it's a beautiful event. And when we celebrate during the celebration itself, it's like we go uh, singing the whole, almost the entire city. Uh, and then, um, so I'm uh, from different places, uh, Tigrans and also other people from uh, international and also other people in Ethiopia as well. They used to join us and then celebrate with us. Uh, but also, for example, I was in the capital when I uh, was working after I graduated. And then uh, I used to always go back home to celebrate Ashenda. I can't miss it. I never miss it. But in uh, my family used to, who were in Addis, used to travel with with me as well because it was all Ashanda is also like right before new year right so they get this their break like their work break during that time so they used to travel, to travel like a uh, couple of days ahead of Ashanda and then uh, we used to go together uh, I remember uh, I, I, as an example to what Ashanda mean to me uh, I remember this event where I was not able to actually travel a couple of days ahead because I was working for this engineering company and then we had a lot of projects to do and then uh, I was not able because I didn't get the permission to go because I have a lot of things to do. But then uh, I also want to go. So I was like in a dilemma. And then, uh, but then later on, I decided to go ahead and get the tickets. And then when I go, I was not able to find a ticket, but I find one which actually uh, flies on the day of Ashanda itself. And then that was it uh, on the evening even like it's like very late and I get the ticket but then uh, so I get the ticket I get my hair braided because it's going to be too late if I go home so I managed to do it in Addis and then um, 
but then during the day, I decided, okay, I think it would be better to just work, to just focus on my work and then celebrate Ashwin the next year in a better way instead of having, because it's late already. And then, so in the morning, I was like, okay, I'll just return the ticket. I'll just miss this agenda. And then all of a sudden, I was like, I just go ahead and open, like I often to Grai TV. And then it, there was like a whole lot of, uh celebration like everyone singing with their beautiful dresses and all and i was like oh no i'm going home <laughs> so <laughs> uh i started collecting my stuff and then i went go home so i just want i bring this example because i want to express like how, how much it means for a lot of people because most of the time at a young age we were like at school learning and supporting our families during our spare time and it's not like we have all this time to go ahead and celebrate. And after we graduate, it's like we're working, we're too busy. But Ashenda is like, it's the whole day is for us. And the fact that um, our family have this beautiful day uh, and blessed day that they only celebrate us and which is dedicated only for us, it just makes it so unique. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, I could I could see um, what Ashenda means to you and the excitement and the joy it gives you written on, on your face. So thanks for going into the little uh, details yeah. that people usually ignore. I think usually they, they talk about the big picture, but they don't go into the minutiae of the events and the routine that you do in preparation. But I think there is beauty embedded in that that people don't usually talk about. So thanks for, for going into those uh, details. And I could I could see the sense of nostalgia that you have now, and hopefully you will get um, an opportunity to celebrate it next year. But I, I, I would presume that Rowena has a slightly different experience, um, given that she, um, well, she, she has she has been in 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 overseas for the most uh, part. Uh, although I know that you you did celebrate Ashanda in your when you were young, uh, mostly it was it was uh, overseas, and that must be a slightly different experience. Could you talk about what um, Ashanda means to you and what are the, the, the lessons that you learned and how did you, how, how does the community that you live with use Ashanda to come together and to celebrate and to, uh, to um, harken back to, to the community back home and other aspects that, that Ashanda is used for uh, by people who live outside Tigray? Um, sure. <clears throat> I'll have to correct you, though, because um, I spent uh, Ashanda every year in Magala um, until I was 17. So <laughs> all my experience. I, 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 I stand home. corrected. I stand corrected. OK. <laughs> it's OK. Um, yeah, so I would travel back and I would be in Magala for Ashanda, which is, um, as all of us know, it's at the end of August. And um, I would kind of spend my time when I was back home in between a distance spending my time around to grow but a lot of it was spent in Magala and um so it's it spans the, the occasion spans from a couple of days it can go on for a number of weeks but I remember celebrating it or like being back home and celebrating it always felt like a monumentous occasion it always felt like there's something big and you know I can plan it with my like just feel that excitement that Xanis was referring to um, with my mum and my aunts and my cousins and, and the neighbours as well. So I feel like I, for many of us in the diaspora, when we experienced Ashanda, um, it was through the lens of um, the women in our family. Um, I felt like growing up, I felt like that added a, a charm to it because it was, it was like, it felt all encompassing. It was women of all ages around you. But I think the older I get, especially, I'm able to realize that it's not, it transcends this idea of like, it's a simple celebration and it's, um, it's a holiday, because it's a holiday exclusively for women, the customs then surrounding that are a reflection of that. So it feels like women centered, but then especially when I was younger, in a more kind of like superficial and a lighter note, it was fun to be 12 and to be out late and um, with friends and cousins and able to do as I please. It felt like it was like a takeover of the city of some sorts, um, which was exciting, which I didn't have access to here, which I'd, I'd never had. And I think that's what added to this charm and like being like it was monumentous. But um, I, for me, it was a, 
kind of like looking back now I understand all these terms of freedom and self-expression it was what it is a holiday in which women are able to exercise agency and autonomy of self and it's it's feeling it's feeling like you're there's no attachment or there's no fear or attachment of fear or shame to what you're doing um, or like there's no gendered connotations to staying out late, dancing, singing in a group of women without any men around, without um, anybody, a man protecting you or overseeing what you're doing. So it was like, there wasn't any, there wasn't a male gaze. There wasn't a man that was centered in it. Um, and then little things like our beauty was for ourselves. It was defined for ourselves. It was, it was, yeah, our beauty was ours without it feeling like it was measured or was dictated by somebody else. And, and there weren't any like hangups in wanting to look beautiful or delighting in that beauty or femininity. Um, yeah, which was really interesting because I was born and was raised in the UK. And so I didn't have access to that. I didn't have experiences like that. Yeah, but you, you mentioned, Rowena, you mentioned femininity and sisterhood and other aspects that people raised uh, during Ashenda. Do, do you think um, girls and women in Tigray uh, and, and overseas uh, use Ashenda as an excuse or as an opportunity to create those bonds and to discuss about different matters that women and girls face? Do, do you think that that is one, one uh, opportunity that it gives women? Definitely. I mean, the songs in itself are about freedom and expression of self, are about gender. They're about wanting to play and not caring what anybody says and defying that. It's an act of defiance in a typically like really patriarchal society. So definitely it's about indulging and encouraging that and um, just working together and, and, and dictating the terms in which you define your womanhood or femininity. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you, uh, Rowena, for, for giving us your, your um, uh, perspective. Um, Elsa, if I can, if I can come back to you, uh, I know that you, you have your own memories and you have your own um, celebrations of agenda uh, since childhood. But I want to to ask you a slightly different uh, question in, in the light of what has happened over the last year for ten months now. We know what has been happening to 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 women, and especially we know the report that. Um, amnesty released um, regarding sexual violence and the gang rape and other indescribable uh, atrocities that have that uh, women of, of Tigray have found at the receiving end of. But still, um, it didn't stop us from celebrating Ashanda, although it was celebrated in a different context and for a different purpose, I, I would say. Could you, maybe you could start by reflecting your own experience um, growing up and celebrating Ashanda, but I would, I would like you to reflect on the unique aspect of, of, of agenda of this year and how it was used to advance the, the cause we have been trying to, to advance uh, given the situation we're in now. Thank you, Tahlai. Uh, it's a very uh, important question. And uh, I, I would like also to start with a little bit of my experience. Uh, most of my Ashenda memories are from my early childhood uh, experiences. Uh, and I share all the beautiful things uh, Rowena and the Kusana said, all the anticipation, the joy and the excitement, everything that they uh, beautifully explained. Uh, but I want to add, um, I grew up in Aksum, so we celebrate uh, at Ashenda on a different day, uh, and we call it Ainuari. It's, I think, eight days after Ashenda. Uh, but the, everything, the essence of uh, the holiday, Ashenda itself is the same. It's just the day is different. Um, uh, like Kasana said, we start planning, we used to start planning and talking about all the things that we are going to, to do, like a month before the actual day. Uh, but these are the memories from my childhood. Um, and uh, I also want to, to add that uh, the memories I have are like from a slightly different era. I grew up during the civil war uh, in late 80s and uh, 90s, early 90s. So I remember 
mostly we were like young girls that we used to uh, celebrate Ashanda during that time. Maybe it was a bit uh, uh, difficult for the mothers and the young adult uh, uh, girls to celebrate. Uh, but uh, I, I think the, the, there were uh, young ladies celebrating, but it was my memories are about like young uh, girls uh, celebrating. Uh, of course, Ashanda has been growing uh, a lot in the past 10 years. So uh, the styles and everything has been also growing at the same time. Uh, but to come to your question, Tahlai, uh, I, I think the, the essence of or the, the nature of uh, Ashanda celebration has been changing even from last year, I would say. Uh, due to COVID, there was these uh, restrictions on mass gathering and public uh, gathering. So I, I remember uh, women and girls talking about how to celebrate it in a safe way. Uh, and in, in the diaspora community, uh, uh, I remember organizing like Zoom uh, celebrations, uh, agenda celebrations via Zoom. Uh, but on top of that, uh, there was also this um, locust invasion uh, that was happening uh, in Tigray and in some parts of Ethiopia. Uh, so I remember seeing pictures of young girls fighting locusts uh, during the Ashenda uh, period last year, around this time. Uh, so I would say uh, women and girls in Tigray were already under, going, they, they were already going under so much stress during last year. And then, uh, like you said, um, uh, in the past, like after the war broke out, uh, in like in the period of eight to nine months, uh, the atrocities and the suffering that the women and girls uh, going through went through uh, are unspeakable. So this year, I think Ashanda was used as an opportunity to amplify the suffering and the the pain uh, women and girls uh, of Tigra are have been enduring. And at, at, at this time also, they are going through um, a lot of uh, pain and uh, sufferings. Uh, uh, the entire population in Tigra is, uh, uh, as you all know, uh, going through a collective punishment, uh, mass starvation. And the women who have been going through uh, a lot of uh, sexual uh, violence, rape, gang rape, and other uh, aspects of um, attack that has been uh, uh, inflicted upon them. They, they, sh they. This time was like after the the military uh, withdrew from Tigray. They they should have had uh, the opportunity to seek help and support. But uh, even though we say that uh, now the, the rape and the sexual violence is, uh, has been stopped, uh, the pain and agony is still uh, happening. They are going through a lot. So uh, this agenda was used to, used, is used to amplify the suffering of those uh, women and uh, girls in Tigray. Uh, but at the same time, uh, rape and sexual violence uh, was um, used, like you said, as at the Amnesty report indicated, it was used as a strategy uh, of war, uh, so to, to inflict pain, but at the same time to humiliate girls and women and to humiliate the population in general. Uh, so uh, while we celebrated Ashenda and uh, use the uh, it to campaign for our uh, sisters in Tigray, we are also using it as a way to resist the, the, the um, I don't know how to say, uh, the, the, the I, I don't know if I, I should say, uh, the enemy that's uh, planning and, uh, um, working to inflict on the woman and the girl is to for us to to be humiliated ashamed and stay uh, silent so 
we are using it to say, no, we cannot be silent. We cannot be silenced. So uh, joy has been used as a form of resistance. Uh, and it gave us, I think, a lot of courage uh, to, uh, to use this opportunity. Um, but uh, at the same time, I would say, um, we feel the sisterhood, so we, we feel that we have every woman, especially in the diaspora, every Tigran uh, woman and uh, girls uh, feel the responsibility to speak up for the girls and women in Tigran. Um, so from that perspective, it's uh, a very uh, quite different from um, the previous agenda celebrations. Yes, uh, indeed. Thank you. thank you. Yeah, thanks, Elsa, for for, for um, going into into details into the pain that um, girls and women uh, have been subjected to uh, over the last year. And like you correctly say, that the enemy, um, if that's the word we should use now, has tried sexual violence and sexual slavery and the other aspects is to try to condemn and uh, to grant women and girls into humiliation. Um, but I think one positive aspect, maybe if we can call it positive, of, of this year's agenda was to try to tell a different story, to try to, mm. try to um, paint women in, in, in positive picture, despite what has happened to them, and to try to depict women of Tigray in, in a positive light, uh, yes. um, despite what has happened. So, Kassanath, I'm, I'm wondering if you could um, build on what um, Elizabeth mentioned and talk about how women were depicted in this year's agenda and how was it different in terms of trying to counter what the enemy is trying to do in, in terms of encouraging women, in terms of creating new sisterhood and other as aspects that you will have observed. If you could talk a little bit about that. Okay, uh, thank you, Dick. Uh, to be very honest, this is very difficult question for me because having to really think about that it, it's really actually for all of us it's very deeply emotional uh well ashenda is particularly joyful celebration about hope renewal and also women right um but it deeply it's deeply changed this year because of the bad things that our people are going through instead of joy we all share this heavy feeling because of the situation of because of the situation back home and um, as we remember our separation from the people we used to celebrate it uh, with and that we're not able to reach them as well. Uh, so that makes it difficult. Uh, I think the hope and the renewal is really felt this year um, after so much pain. This year, I think we all know more deeply what those words mean. And celebrating women and girls this year also means commemorating the survival the survivors of this sexual violence, mourning their pain and also commuting to their support as well. Uh, as Elsa has also mentioned, uh, we want to pray that this season will be over soon and um, a new or renewal will come for all of us to heal together. When I say new season to come for, for us to heal, um, I don't mean like uh, that we wait for space and time, but since it's this is personal opinion, uh, for me, it would be for us to heal whenever we're ready. Mm -hmm. I can only say uh, and wish that uh, uh, for us to be ready. Uh, I wish we are ready now, all of us. And for the victims and for the people that we think are doing all the bad things. I wish we all heal now. That, that's all I can say. Yeah, I do. I do understand your, your uh, pain, um, Sanet. Um, I will, if I could come to to Chessie, um, I'm sure you you will be aware from your study uh, of Tigran women and Tigran culture in general that historically Tigrans have this this culture of celebrating pain and and suffering using joy and celebrations. I, I'm sure you will have seen footages of. Um, former TPLF fighters, for instance, dancing and, and celebrating even after they have buried a, a, a comrade. It's, it's a common tradition in Tigray to use celebration as a form of fighting. 
And this in particular agenda um, has been used uh, as, as a form of expressing joy, but for, for a different purpose to, to resist and to, to advance a, a cause. Can you, can you talk a little bit about how, because this seems paradoxical, how do, how do people use joy and celebration to, to resist? And could you talk in particular about how Tigrayan women, the celebration of Tigrayan women and, the, um, and, uh, and those sorts of things could be summoned and used for, for resistance? Absolutely, yeah, that's a great question. Um, joy is powerful. First and foremost, joy is powerful. Um, and if we look at autocratic regimes across history, across time, joyful things are often banned. So in uh, Nazi-occupied former Czechoslovakia, for example, traditional folk music was banned. Um, Beethoven has been outlawed in China uh, and North Korea, carefully monitors the music that's allowed to be played. Um, and of course, most recently in Addis, we've heard that places that were playing to grow music have been either closed or forced to stop playing their music. So and similarly, uh, suppressing cultural dances has been a tool of British colonialism, um, as has been controlling religious expression, controlling language. Uh, language is a very intricate form of oppression and resistance, which is why Tabrinia was targeted under the Derg regime. Um, maintaining language is a really important method of resistance. And I did a study a few years ago on uh, the protectorate of Bohemia and Mar Maravia, which is part of the former Czech Republic. Um, which is about how jokes were used to suppress, uh, was, jokes were suppressed under the Nazis. Um, but they were a way, using humor, using jokes were a way for the local population to maintain unity and identity, uh, and sometimes as a form of resistance, when language and its connections to national pride are being targeted by the Nazi state. Um, and this is because joy is ultimately a way to channel energy and create momentum. And this threatens any ruling force that has precarious control and relies on strict hierarchies of age and gender, ethnicity, and so on. And this affects women quite strongly. And we see this around the world in the suppression of women's sexual expression, uh, women's body autonomy, as well as a form of regulating the population by controlling reproduction and hierarchy, uh, and also information and values. And it's, it's found when we see what are designated as typically feminine forms of joy like clothing or romance being degraded because this reinforces patriarchal hierarchies that privilege masculinity and the associated values. And I think this is partly what's so beautiful about Ashenda is its unreserved celebration of womanhood in all its ordinariness. Ashenda promotes joy through group strength and is this collaborative element that I think is really important when we, we look at the representation of women's resilience in history because we can often fall into the trap of hero worship or heroine worship, where we select an individual and we put them on a pedestal for their exceptionalism and, and set them apart from everybody else. Um, but this is quite damaging when it can be seen to represent that only some women are capable of some things. But the meanings imbued in Ashenda is to celebrate womanhood at the most normal level, so womanhood in its pure unexceptionalism, and it, and it does this through group community focus of women coming together to celebrate women, just as they are and for all that they do. Um, and celebrations and joy in this way are a really natural part of human expression and an embodiment in some ways of what it is to be alive and to thrive. Um, and communal joy is something really unifying and that we inherently seek out sometimes even subconsciously. It helps uh, release the oxytocin chemical at a scientific level where we bond with other people and we feel love for them. And so you, there's some studies that have recorded that choir singers have synchronized heart rates when they're singing and connecting with each other. Um, and if you're co-sleeping with a partner, you will sometimes synchronize your heart rate with them. And what this means is that ultimately, a people, a population that feels unified, that feel like they belong to one another and are part of one another and not as just individuals for themselves, they are harder to dominate and they're harder to break apart. And suppressing joy, particularly cultural joy, is a method of dehumanization. And in its most extreme, it's cultural genocide. And continuing to seek out joy in the hardest of circumstances is a way of holding on to humanity and refusing to give up what it means to be one self, to be your identity. Um, and in this sense, it's a form of activism and a form of resistance to choose joy. And one of the biggest challenges about a protracted war is sustaining it, sustaining the drive for the fight, sustaining activism, momentum for campaigns. These are thankless tasks, the progress can feel slow, 
but existing in a prolonged state of negativity leads to burnout. Um, finding joy, on the other hand, is restorative. It gives you a renewed purpose and a reminder of what it is that you're fighting to preserve. And finally, it just in the context of the Tagai War, where women have experienced such unspeakable violence, I think celebrating Tagai and women goes beyond the gender this year. Recognizing their beauty, resilience, creativity, self-love, sisterhood, all the things that Ashenda puts front and center is, is really a way to recognize their trauma and make a promise that this does not define them. Joy is resistance, love is resistance, and refusing to categorize the guy and women in a way that an oppressor would want them to be categorized as a victim, as damaged, is part of that resistance as well. So I think loving to grind women in all their splendor this agenda is also about making sure the story of to grind women is not defined by pain and trauma. And I want to make it clear that by that, I don't mean that the women who have themselves experienced the violence need to classify themselves in that way. No one can speak for that except for them. And it, you know, they will need psychological and physical support for the rest of their lives. But I still think that we as onlookers need to move away from the narrative that women are passive victims in a man's war and recognize the way that they shape and create identity for themselves through love and supporting one another and through owning their freedom and through their refusal to be silenced. Thank you, um, Chessie, for, for, for beautifully explaining how uh, joy could be used as a form of resistance. But I say this because um, one of the one of the tools that the, the people who have been supporting the war and the people who have been dismissing the suffering of the grants have employed is to say, well, you can't be suffering. The, the suffering that you're talking about is fake and, and imagined because if you are um, suffering, how is it that you are um, celebrating? How is it that you are um, dancing? How is it that you are um, going into this cultural event and, and stuff? And people don't seem to understand that in some cultures and definitely in Tigray cultures, joy and celebration could be used as a form of uh, resistance. That, that was uh, uh, beautifully explained. So um, thank you, uh, Jesse. But I will go to, to Hagos and I'm, I'm, I, will, I will ask you kind of the same question that I had asked to, to Rowena Hagos. And if you could reflect the new um, dimension and the new essence and the meaning that Ashanda could assume uh, going forward in the given what has happened and given how it has been used this year, uh, do you do you think there would be a fundamental change in the way people will will use um, Ashanda? Okay, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah. Yeah, it has, uh, I think, been uh, explained much by, by a lot of uh, the sisters. Um, what I can understand during this uh, Ashenda time, uh, I've been asking if Ashenda once was uh, abrupted uh, in the history of the cry, and I, I don't think it did. Uh, it was only like last year because of Corona and, and uh, this year uh, because of, uh, I mean, the challenges of Ashenda. Uh, last year, they were celebrating Ashenda and then at the same time protecting uh, this locust. And this year, uh, they are celebrating Ashenda and, 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 and even there are um, to grand ladies who are members of TDF, uh, and then even they were celebrating there. Uh, so um, this year, Ashenda was uh, a reverence and uh, celebration uh, in both cases. But most of the time in the Tigran, uh, in the Tigran social value, when it comes to such kind of uh, atrocities, problems, mainly from outside, the uh, grants used to use it to um, make this kind of uh, the notion of uh, resilience and using that kind of uh, agony as an inertia uh, for, I mean, it's like stringing uh, positive energy uh, like in a very high wave frequency so that the, it can create a kind of a strong energy in the first coming. So the same was true for Ashenda uh, this year. I mean, it's really touchy, it's really traumatizing. Um, 
yeah, uh, and one thing that we can understand why the Tigrayan leaders have been raped, have been killed, is uh, simply because uh, they did they, they re refused uh, to have they were not willing to have um, sex with whom they they don't know because they have been exercising freedom uh, like in Ashenda time. Uh, so the sense of raping and the sense of the, the reason why they have been killed uh, is also justifiably or justifiably can be can, can be explained that they refused to be raped or they refused to have sex uh, because they have they have been exercising freedom throughout their life and that pinnacle part of uh, or an exemplar Part of this is agenda time, so we can we can see that the grand leaders have uh, good knowledge epistemologically exposed to what freedom is, that they are autonomous to their body, to their expression, and so on and so forth. So the the, the why the why the violence becomes severe is simply because um, all the Tigrayan leaders are exposed to freedom and then they refused to be raped. Um, and um, this Ashenda time, it's really a pity that they have been denied uh, their freedom to celebrate Ashenda, that it's a time of reverence, not Zan celebrating Ashenda. But still, when I see around the world, in the globe, and in then in the, in the TDF members even in Tigray, they are just celebrating it with with two three meaning um, meanings. The discourse here I, I am observing is one. It's like uh, it's like commemorating, venerating ladies or women who were raped during the war in the last nine eight months. Just remembering them. It's a kind of reverence. Second, it's uh, a kind of joyful celebration. Um, a kind of defending or, you know, the intention of the invaders, the intention of these uh, people who, 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 who raped the Tigrayan leaders was to, to Ashim, the Tigrayan leaders, or to Ashim in general, the society. So it's like, we are not getting, we are not getting ashamed of ourselves. We are proud of ourselves. I am proud of a woman kind of releasing energy. So it's, they are celebrating with a kind of, it's not, I don't, I don't call it it's rage, but it's like a kind of positive energy. And then it can be a platform, stepping stone even in the first coming. And I even I I assume, or maybe I can also recommend in the first coming that Ashenda will be not only um ladies celebration or festivity or carnival, but I think it will grow to a big institution that will see it in a global table to give justice on women. Uh, so I, 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 for sure, there will be a big agenda institutional uh, agenda institution for justice b b because once agenda become like agenda has to be very substantiated or it has to be registered in in, in, in UNESCO then this event by itself has, I think, branded Ashenda more than ever. Uh, so all these ingredients can, um, can bring or can contribute their own share in bringing Ashenda and institutionalize Ashenda as a big platform for justice, mainly for women in Africa or, or around the world. So as, as, as most of you, uh, mentioned uh, or said uh, it can it, it has its own positive uh, positive results respective of the negative uh, or the the other things and i believe in Tigray and also around the world lead, ladies will celebrate it more in the first coming and next year for example and i believe they will remember there will be a kind of contemplation of or kind of uh, anticipating and venerating uh, the ladies of Tigray. Like, you know, in Tigray, we, we remember the martyrs that we have lost uh, throughout history. So I also recommend and believe, for example, in the next year, 
there will be at least one day or one hour or a kind of uh, two, three hours, couple of hours, a kind of contemplation or prayer to remember these honorable, disrespected ladies, women, and, and, and teenagers that we have lost uh, in 2020 and 2021. And this will bring, I think, uh, a kind of uh, synergy and teamwork of the ladies to bring it into an institution, and then modernize it more, and then to have a say in the global stage for all women around the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hagos. I think you, you have raised a, a, a huge point when you say that the, the essence and significance of Ashenda could be elevated in, in the light of what has happened um, over the last year. And we could, we could, uh, we could make it a new venue for, for channeling our frustrations and for, for, for doing other uh, things that we would want to do as, as a people. But can I, can I do some mic check with, with Rowena? Are you back, really? We had lost you for a, for a moment earlier. I'm back. Can you guys hear and see me well? We, I can hear you now. Uh, so I will, I will ask you the same question again, but I, maybe I will reframe it, um, given that Hagos has um, said, um, kind of answered the, the question. So we, we mentioned earlier that Ashanda had, it was purely religious in its beginning, in its origins, but due to historical contingencies, it has become the thing that it has become now, which is all inclusive, uh, different aspects from femininity, from liberty, from freedom, from um, equality to other aspects. And given what has happened to us as a people, it wouldn't be a surprise if some of the frustration and some of the pain that we have been made to endure would find their expressions in Ashenda going forward. So I, I can imagine Ashenda fundamentally um, changing going forward. Do you, do, you see, do you see that? Do you see that Ashenda will, will in, in a basic fundamental way change uh, in the future? Um, yeah, I think it would, um, without, you know, if you're, if we're acknowledging what has happened in the last, in the last nine months, it would be, um, I don't know, I just think it's inevitable that it would evolve into something else naturally as it did from the beginning. Um, so I can kind of imagine that it would, you know, it will become a necessity to celebrate Ashenda. It will become, as Jesse said, a form of joy is a form of resistance. And I think um, because so much of our identity and our, you know, our tradition, our customs have become so politicized, this in itself will become a political statement. Um, so, you know, kind of by default, by engaging in Instagram culture, you'll be making, it'll be an act of defiance in the eyes of some, and the eyes of those who have been inflicting the the um, violence onto grind women and on what it means womanhood in general, I suppose. Um, but it will become a kind of future celebrations will become a celebration of womanhood or of liberation. And I can imagine it will be felt more um, with a sense of remembrance, similar to what Hagos said. Um, but also it could play a monumental part in our healing process in um, or it could symbolize that also. Um, but it could be that we kind of like reframe and reshape kind of words and terminology we use when discussing survivors of the sexual violence. Um, so, you know, oftentimes like when we discuss Ashenda, it may, it may help us address these ideas of worth and purity that we've previously um, attached and what these terms um, what these terms symbolize, what's attached to them, um, what it means to be a Tagayan woman under the guise of purity and innocence and worth, um, which will make that an aspect of our liberation as well. So this idea that our worth isn't intertwined with what's perceived as innocence, or what's perceived as um, what's attached to innocence, um, but also kind of like reframing words we use when um, Kind of words we use when discussing survivors of sexual violence. It's I I think it will be instrumental um, to future celebrations of Ashanda when especially a population like ours that has been as brutalized as ours that will change the course of future celebrations. So it will be I think as a result of that or as a consequence of that you're unpacking ways in which as a community we perceive and understand trauma, especially something as as horrid as sexual violence. 
Um, and I think because of these things, because of these contributing factors, Ashanda will play a massive part in the future in, what, in, in our healing process as, as a community and our acceptance and tolerance as well. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think um, going forward, other people, we will, we will utilize every cultural asset and Ashanda is a big, huge cultural asset in our um, uh, repertoire to, to advance ourselves as a society. Uh, so that's a good point you, you raise. So I will go to my final question, and it's going to be to, to Elsa. Um, I, I want to um, ask you, Elsa, about... Um, now, we, we were saying that the things that we do on, on Ashenda, femininity, freedom, and the other all good things that we do on Ashenda, you want them to be done throughout the year. There, there aren't things that you want them to be restricted to one day or one week per, per year, right? And I'm, I'm just wondering if you could think of ways um, of how we could extend those things to, to, to become embedded in our culture, to, to be done always, not just one day or, or one year, and how it could become a community effort rather than only women and, and girls, but men could also be brought in to, 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 to the fold and we use it, we utilize it to, to better ourselves as a, as a society. Can you, can you think of ways how we could do that? Thank you, Talai. Um, I think that's a very fundamental question that we all need to think about in like future celebrations because it's about women and it's about girls. It's about sisterhood, all this uh, nice things you mentioned, the femininity, beauty and everything. But also Ashanda is about society. So it's very important that men feel uh, involved uh especially when we think of how Shanda is being celebrated this year so like you guys said uh, the the meaning of Ashanda or the meaning that will be attached to how Ashanda is celebrated will be changed of course uh, so we have been trying like for the last uh, 10 months we have been trying to make sense of what's happening uh, as individuals as women men uh, and the whole society uh, so Ashanda could be uh, one uh, platform to 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 find uh, to understand and to find the meaning. So in in that process, it it cannot be only for women and girls. Uh, it needs to be a very inclusive uh, platform that all feel involved. I'm sure uh, maybe uh, Hagos could could uh, add that men have uh, like. They play a great role, a young boys' great role in Ashanda celebrations, but it's of course a women's day. Um, but I think, I mean, for me growing up in a like slightly conservative uh, society, Ashanda was probably the only day that you feel like you get to be you. So that's the fundamental essence that we need to really unpack. What does that mean to understand uh, uh, what does uh, being you mean, what does, especially for women, for girls, and uh, uh, to have, uh, it's, it's not only the women going out and celebrating, singing, and uh, uh, feeling the joy, it's the society is behind them when, the, when they do that. So we, we need to understand that, to, to study that, uh, to, to, to make it uh, the concepts and the essence behind it that, uh, that we can relate to our, our daily life. Like when we say Ashanda girls, we, we respect their choices. So what does uh, respecting women's choice means? Uh, what does that uh, joy as a as, as a resistance uh, means? So all the all these things uh, we need to understand. We need to study in order to understand. We need to talk about them all the time. Uh, maybe not every day, but we need to give a platform to those ideas because most of the time we we try to understand and analyze concepts that uh, come from. Uh, the Western world, the developed world, when we think of uh, development, 
uh, harmony, democracy, and uh, stuff like that. So we need to come back and look at this peculiar um, uh, culture and tradition and understand it, what that means from the, from the perspective of creating a harmonious and uh, 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 developed or, uh, I don't know uh, how to say it, but uh, a well-being of the society could be utilized through understanding of our own uh, cultures. So you find everything in, in, in Ashenda, the things that we want to have, the things that we want to sell to, to experience in our daily life, but we don't talk about them. So one mechanism is to talk about them, uh, to really uh, uh, kind of uh, categorize what it means uh, in from the women perspective, from men perspective, and from the society in general. Um, and at the, the same time, uh, uh, Jesse and uh, uh, Hagos were talking about the, the possibility of having teamwork during Agenda. I think lo looking back now, I, I think it was the early years of my life where I learned coordination and working together with people and uh, kind of uh, learning how to plan ahead about things. And Ashenda is the only time that almost everyone in Tigray can, can come together. Uh, so we, we could use uh, that platform to kind of um, uh, enhance working uh, in teams and uh, uh, coordinating in different uh, uh, aspects of life, uh, but uh, not only just the day of celebration, but we, we, we can use that day to create something that can be used throughout uh, uh, daily life or yeah, for, for, for the society in general. Uh, but we, it needs uh, discussion and talking about it and writing, of course, about it. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, uh, celebrating it, yeah. of course. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think the, the, the most important point you raise is Ashenda is a day or a week when you become yourself. And the, for me, the most important takeaway from that is that we have to, we have to aspire to create a society where people can become themselves, not just on those weeks, but every, mm. every day. And it becomes mm. an inherent uh, aspect of our culture. So th that's the wish, but again, you can't just wish and things don't happen. You have to work, you have to strive for that. So that, that would be my, um, mm. my takeaway message. But I think we have gone past the, the a lot of time. But nonetheless, I would give you one minute each to, to summarize because I really like this discussion, so who cares? So I will start with, with Hagos and I will give you one minute, but don't go beyond one minute. You meet, uh, yeah, okay, please thank go. You. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I, 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 I also, you know, Ashenda is a kind of uh, disclosure of, a disclosure for the hibernated kind of uh, freedom within the ladies or teenagers. And then it's like a pause or a break um, of uh, uh, dominance. Uh, I mean, the ladies who are not independent uh, in other and days other than Ashenda. So as, as uh, El Savit said, it has to be uh, Ashenda should be a center of the wave that has to be ex expanded to, to our daily life. And most of the time in gender cases, uh, the problem I see are like the gender uh, institutions advise the woman, but it has to, the, the advice has to be for the man, mainly for the man, otherwise for all. Uh, so yeah, I, I could have said many, uh, I mean, Incidences what what I had come across in in, in, in Tigray or in Malala, and we wouldn't have time. So, yeah, we should exercise it. Uh, freedom should not be uh, 
a notion of celebrate celebration or carnival and so on, but it's to, it should be daily life. And then mainly we men have to understand and have to talk about it, have to write about it. Um, yeah, we have to respect our mothers, our um, sisters, and then uh, everything. Uh, yeah, that's what I can yeah. say. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Jesse? Yeah, um, this has been so wonderful. So thank you all so much for sharing your experiences. Um, just one story that came to mind when we were talking was um, actually from uh, Auschwitz. And one of the prisoners there was trading rations uh, in order to gather material to celebrate Hanukkah. And he was asked, how can you be doing Hanukkah in Auschwitz? And he said, no, we especially do Hanukkah in Auschwitz. And that just really came to mind when we're thinking about Ashenda this year, of all years, this year is a year for women to celebrate women. So thank you all. Thank you, Jesse. Um, Cassandra? Thank you. Um, I actually don't have much to say, but I would like to stress on Elizabeth's idea, you also summarized it as well, that uh, let's not just make it a week or two or three days event, but then let's uh, exercise to let other people be themselves. Uh, I would also reiterate that in a way, not only, see, not, I, I wouldn't, uh, of course, I want to put this responsibility on the society and everyone involved as well, but also on the girls themselves, the people who are celebrating it, what does it mean to be you? Figuring that out and then mm. living that would would mean uh, a good accomplishment. So I would, I just want to stress on that. Thank you, Xana, and thank you for joining us in a very short notice. And Rowena? Um, well, I think many things. <laughs> um, <laughs> I hope um, Ashanda remains um, an occasion in which beauty and womanhood are defined entirely by Tigrayan women and not by non-Tigrayan or Western standards. And I hope it um, just remains a symbol of, of joy and resistance in the most uh, authentic way. And it's um, used in our um, a process of, of healing, rebuilding, and um, yeah, fosters more conversations of, of tolerance and acceptance. Thank you, and thank you for the gorgeous Ashenda hairdo. Appreciate that. And uh, finally, Elizabeth, one minute. Thank you, thank you, everyone. This was a really wonderful uh, time, and uh, to reflect on Ashenda, I think this is the first time that we, I, I have, uh, I get to discuss what it means, what was their experience, and stuff like that. So um, I wish, I hope that we can do uh, programs like this in the future. Uh, and I also hope that uh, uh, Hagos mentioned that there, there has been some uh, initiatives to to advocate Ashen, to, for Ashenda to become a UNESCO what what is it called UNESCO heritage yeah yeah so to be registered uh, in UNESCO heritage so I really hope we take that seriously and we work and. Uh, continue the initiatives that had been done before uh, for Ashenda to be recognized, to get the, the recognition that it deserves. Uh, and uh, thank you, everyone. <laughs> thanks, Elsa, and thanks for the gorgeous um, dress as well. Um, so it was, it was, uh, it was <laughs> brilliant for me to, to sit here and listen to you guys reflect and give different perspectives. And my hope for next year is that we don't do it on, on Zoom, but we go to Matala and meet in person dance and do this kind of panel discussion. That would be my wish, and I'm 100% sure that it would become a reality. But for today, I appreciate you joining me, and thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night.